That's one children's sermon we'll never forget. Well, I'll remember that one. And I know it was all about temptation, but I was actually taking away another lesson. Oh. And the other lesson was this. You can't believe everything you see on the internet. <laughs> I know it worked on the internet. No, I did Okay. It, I'm, it is so we, cool. We're all imagining that when it, it, it was really there, cool to see so that stuff cool. down in there. Yeah. Yeah. I think the nailed it version was way better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I live to give people. Well, <clears throat> it's like it's like the the magic trick that doesn't work. I mean, everybody goes, yeah. oh. Oops. Okay, but we get it. It you know it it was effective. Got the kids are involved. You know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like I say, if anybody wants the gig, just <laughs> yeah. no way. Uh, for grabs. Be able to go home and film that, really working at your house, and then bring them. We'll show it. Thank you. I will do that, Paul. There you go. That's a good you gift. Can. Burn your house down. We're <laughs> <laughs> doing the garage, and do it outside or something. Yeah. It's on you. <clears throat> All righty. Well, let's switch gears. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 as we pick it up today in chapter 2. We'll be looking at verses. Chapter 2, verse 12, and we'll go down through chapter 3 and verse 3. Paul writes, Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the results of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word yet again this morning, we look forward to what you have for us. And we know that even in this section and in these verses, you have very clear teaching for us. I pray, Father, that as we draw those lessons and principles out, that it might be ones that we can take away from here and pray about and to use in our own lives. We pray that they'll be accurate, that we'll have discerned the Word of God accurately. And so we thank you now in Christ's name. Well, I know for a fact that most Christians that I have spoken to over the years actually admit that they are terrified of doing personal evangelism. And I've talked to a lot of people about that, and they give a lot of different reasons. For example, 
they give reasons like, well, they, they just don't know the Bible well enough. And it's really hard to uh, talk to someone about Jesus if you don't know the Bible very well. Or they say they don't know how to open up the whole subject, how to get there, how, how, to, how to transition into talking about the Savior. Or they say that they don't know how to answer objections because if it's a conversation and objections begin to be raised by that person, they go blank or they don't know how to answer those objections. Sometimes they say they're afraid that they'll be ridiculed, that they'll be rejected for their faith, and so they shy away from ever sharing their faith. And then sometimes they say, you know, I'm just really not an evangelist. I'm just an average, ordinary Christian. And you can't really expect me to be an evangelist. Now those are some of the reasons that I've heard over the years. And if the truth be told, very few Christians ever truly share their faith with an unsaved person. You know, I think it's that neglect which is one of the primary causes for churches dying today. And in a day when the cults are thriving because their adherents dare to take their message directly, unashamedly to people, the church, I think, needs to regain the urgency, the compulsion of the Great Commission as it was commanded to us by Jesus. So, as we look at this whole topic this morning, and we will see it in the passage that we just read, what we're going to find are a number of lessons. John Wesley, for example, said to his students that you have only one business, and that is the salvation of souls. Or David Brainerd, who was an early missionary to Africa, at the close of his long missionary life, wrote in his diary, I cared not how I lived, nor what hardship I went through, if only I might gain souls for Christ. And so as we look at our passage this morning, it does have to do with evangelism, or whatever you want to call it. If you want to call it witnessing, some people call it soul winning, some people just say sharing Christ. Whatever you call it, it's all the same. It's about evangelism. And so I think there are at least four important principles that we can glean from this passage, from these verses, and they're all going to center around that idea of personal evangelism. So let me take you to the first one. It's in verses 12 and 13, and I'm calling it the principle of opportunity. The principle of opportunity. Now, here's the principle. The Lord sovereignly creates opportunities for us to tell others about Jesus. Now these first couple of verses are really kind of a short parenthetical reference by Paul about his travels. And I think they offer the reason as to why he was not able to immediately get back to Corinth to see the Corinthian people. And so he says that he had gone to this city called Troas, and he wanted to preach the gospel there, and he says that a door was open to him for the Lord. You see, God had sovereignly created an opportunity for Paul in the city of Troas. And that's why we call this first principle the principle of opportunity. Now, I want you to notice the metaphor that Paul uses here because he calls it a door. And he apparently liked that particular metaphor. In fact, he uses it several other times in Scripture and in his letters. So take your Bibles and turn back about three pages back you'll find yourself in 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Chapter 16, verse 9. Chapter 16 
and verse 9. So he says in verse 8, but I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost. And then he says, because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. Now he's writing to the same readers, to the Corinthians. And he's talking about a great door of opportunity has opened for him. Now, go the other direction in your New Testament and go to Colossians chapter 3. Find Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. I'm having trouble this morning with those things. <laughs> chapter 4 and verse 3. Notice here at the end of this letter, he says, And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. He's asking them to pray that a door would be open for an opportunity for him to share the gospel. In fact, Luke, in describing the ministry of Barnabas and Paul, uses this idea in Acts chapter 14 and verse 27. He says, they gathered the church uh, together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And what we're seeing is that every time this metaphor of a door is used in the New Testament, it's always referring to evangelism to sharing the gospel. And did you happen to notice that in each case, who it was that opened that door? If you said God, then that's correct. It wasn't Paul, it wasn't Barnabas, it wasn't somebody else. It was God. It was God who was sovereignly opening those doors for the gospel. Now, open doors are kind of like entry points. We know that the door swings on hinges, and we use it to go in or to go out of. And that's why it's such an appropriate metaphor here, because it's like an entry point for you to share the gospel. It's an opportunity that God is giving you. Now, there's a corollary principle that I want to mark out quickly that goes along with this. When God has sovereignly opened a door to speak to someone about Jesus, we must be willing and able to go through and seize that opportunity. Maybe that's implicit in this whole idea, but look, if God is opening a door, as Paul is saying here, then you have to be willing to go through. And as I was thinking about that this week, I came across something in my files that I've kept for a long time, and it was called 10 Tips for Entering the Door of Evangelism. So I've put them here for you. They're very simple. I won't say much about each one of them. But, but taken as a whole, I think they're very appropriate at this point. So for example, the first one is that you need to be patient. When that door of opportunity has opened, understand this is God's work, that you are an instrument in God's hands. He wants to use you to share the gospel. But you have to be patient sometimes for that door to open. Secondly, try to see things through the other person's eyes. Their fears might seem irrational, but they are real to them. And as you're in a conversation with somebody and, and that door of opportunity, that door of opportunity has opened up, that, that person might show fear in some way. Either, either they change the subject or, or maybe even their body language. And, and, and you've got to not only be patient, but you've got to understand that this might be the first time they've ever heard these ideas. And they're maybe even a little fearful to them as you talk about maybe eternity. So you've got to put yourself in their place. Thirdly, 
Be sensitive to their spiritual condition, their thought process, their feelings, because each person is absolutely unique. Be sensitive to their spiritual condition. Number four, use positive rather than negative persuasion. Make Christianity positive, not just what's left after you've destroyed all their arguments. And you might very well be able to, point for point, argue them down and show them why what they're saying just can't be true or doesn't make sense. But that's not what wins them to Christ in the end. It's the Holy Spirit working in their hearts, and you need to turn that and be positive, not simply always negative. Number five. Have your own life in order. Be an ambassador and a role model. Have your own life in order. Many years ago, I don't even remember who told this story, but uh, this particular man was a preacher. He was a pastor, and he was flying on uh, one of the major carriers, United or somebody, maybe American, and he sat down in his seat, and next to him, a, a, a young woman sat down. And uh, he always liked to at least introduce himself or say hello or say a few things just to be nice. And um, it struck into a full conversation. <clears throat> and as they took off and began flying toward their destination, it continued. And finally, the young woman turned to him and said to him, by the way, what is it that you do for a living? You know what his answer was? I love this. Oh, I'm an ambassador. He didn't say he was a pastor or a preacher. He said, I'm an ambassador. Do you think that got her attention? Where do you think that led? An ambassador. Oh, for what country? You can imagine what he said from there. That's a great line. I've always wanted to use that line, actually. <laughs> Someday maybe God will open that door and I'll be able to use that very line. Number six, use the Bible in your discussion. Now, that's what scares people. And you don't have to have memorized certain verses. And I know that a lot of teach, well, you, you've got to have four, five, six, eight, ten verses that takes you right through all of sin and falls short of the glory of God and takes you right on down to the gospel. You know what? That's such a canned approach in a lot of ways. And yes, those are scripture. They're important. They can and should be used if you have them memorized. But look, if you've never memorized scripture, don't use that as an excuse that you can't share the gospel. Paraphrase it. Just paraphrase it. Just say, you know, you know what the Bible says? And you have the general idea? If you can't come up with it immediately, just paraphrase it. It's okay. Or you say to them, you know, I, I don't have my Bible with me here, but maybe when we get together again, I'll bring my Bible, and I'll show you some of these things. Don't use that as an excuse that you won't be able to share the gospel with. Number seven, recognize the, un the uncomfortable or quiet periods in your conversation and offer sensitivity and support. Sometimes we think that it just has to be a monologue. We have to just keep talking. And the person is quiet. Maybe it's time to just stop. Let it soak in a little bit. They're thinking about it, maybe. You say... Does what I just said ring any bells for you? Does it mean anything to you? Because they're mulling it over. They've got to have time to absorb maybe what is brand new spiritual truth to them. Number eight, <clears throat> invite them to activities with other Christians. This is a really easy one. How, how hard is it to invite someone to come to some Christian activity? I mean, one of the reasons that we did that parenting conference yesterday was 
actually, as we tried to spread that far and wide in every means we could throughout the community, uh, it was on the radio, it was, it, it was flyers put everywhere, we actually wanted to see other people, not just our own that were here, but other people come as well. Because we knew that they would be with Christian people, they would see a Christian message with Christians on these videos, and that might lead to the right conversation. Invite them to other activities. My kids <clears throat> grew up quite a bit of their life in Arizona, at least their junior high and senior high years especially. And uh, the junior high and senior high that they went to because of the community we lived in was highly populated by Mormons. Now, we didn't live in Mesa. Mesa has the highest population of Mormons out, outside Salt Lake City of anywhere in the world. But we were in another nearby community that had a lot of Mormons. A lot of Mormons. And a lot of their friends, at least at school, were Mormons. And my son was in the cross-country team. And uh, it was a small group, even though it was a very large high school, it was a smaller group of guys. And uh, one of the guys that they would run with and take their long runs with was a, a Mormon kid. He was a really nice kid. They always are, in fact. But this kid kept asking my son, hey, do you want to come to my, my youth group? We got a really great youth group. You want to come to my youth group? And we had talked to my son and my daughter about this stuff. And I'm so proud of my son because you know what his answer was? Will you come to mine? And the kid says, no, I can't do that. And so Elliot said, well, I'm not coming here, son. But Elliot understood what was happening. That this kid wanted to get him in that environment with other Mormon kids. Because then they could talk to him. And we should also take a lesson there and realize that, that there are activities that we hold and do just so that we can invite neighbors and friends and those who don't know Christ. It's a good thing. Here's number nine. Realize that the salvation of their souls is a spiritual battle. The enemy does not give us his spoil easily. You're in a spiritual battle when you speak to someone about Christ. And finally, give God all, all the glory when a person decides to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior because it's the Holy Spirit who's doing the work. So, our first principle is the principle of opportunity. Think about, is God opening a door here? Is this something that he wants me to go through? Here's the second principle. I know you're going to laugh at this one. It's called the principle of odor. I said that right, the principle of odor. Here's why I say that. Because in our passage, the principle is that our testimony should be like a sweet-smelling fragrance to others. Now, if Paul goes on in verses 14 to 16, and there seems to be no doubt that he's thinking of the Roman triumphal victory procession because he talks about Christ leading it. And when a conquering Roman general returned to Rome in triumph, there would be a public holiday declared and people would throng to the Via Sacra, the sacred way. That was the principal street through Rome at that time. And they would see this victorious army parading gloriously into the capital. And as these pictures show, one's an artist's rendition. But the second one is actually a relief carving from that era depicting that Roman general and those around him. Now, in the victory procession, there would be a long line of captives. And these captive people would be representative of those that were subjugated in that particular war. And they were often chained 
to the chariot. Here, they're in that relief, they're just close by. They're often chained to the chariot wheels, and they would be holding censers. Now, a censer is that which holds incense in it so that it can burn. And they would be holding censers in their hands. And that censer would be giving off a sweet aroma, a fragrance, a fragrance, an odor, if you will. And some were walking in front of the general, and some were walking behind the general. And so there were two kinds of prisoners. You can advance that. There were two kinds of prisoners represented here. Now, the first kind of prisoner was a commended prisoner. They were the ones who were commended to life. These prisoners walked in front of the general and his chariot. These were the men and women who had accepted the conquest of the Romans. They were actually rejoicing as they marched along. Now, what were they rejoicing about? They were rejoicing because on that very day, they would be set free. And the smell of their incense was an aroma of life, Paul says. But they wouldn't return to their faraway lands. They would stay with their masters and they would voluntarily serve them even though they were freed slaves now. So that was the commended prisoners. They were commended to life. But there were also the condemned prisoners. And these prisoners were condemned to death. These were the rebellious captives who were not going to surrender under any circumstances. And so they walked behind the general, also chained. They also carried censers. But they were marked for death, because as they proceeded into Rome, they would be marched directly to the stadium, to the Colosseum, because in the next few days, they would be thrown to the wild animals to be ripped apart. They were condemned to death, and their censors gave off an aroma of death. Now, Paul's illustration is very, very clear here. In verse 14, he says that the one who is leading, so the one that is like the victorious general, is Christ. Christ is the victor here. And it is Christ, not us, who leads this procession. And he always leads us, he says. We are the captives. But we are the commended ones, not the condemned ones. We are to be set free into a new life. But we voluntarily choose to serve our new master, who is Jesus. And so the censers that we carry, that fragrance, that aroma that rises up, that is an aroma to life, Paul says. It's an aroma to others as well. And you know, there's no greater freedom than to be taken captive by Jesus Christ. That's our lot. But to the others, that same aroma that is being given off is an aroma that brings death. And as we speak to people about the Savior, some will smell our incense as a sweet aroma and they will accept that message. They will accept Jesus as their Savior. And so they will join the procession. And they also will be commended to life, eternal life. But as we all know, there will be others who will reject our message, who don't want to listen to it, who will say, that's not for me, or they don't believe it. And they will be condemned, Paul says, to eternal death. For them, that aroma is death. Now, here's the application. 
we don't change the incense. The actual incense is the same. And if you carry the metaphor through, the incense would be the message of the gospel. It's the same. The message of the gospel is the same for everyone. But some will smell it as a message of life, and others will reject it and smell it as a message of death. And that part is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is simply to carry that censer and let that aroma permeate all of those around us. Now, our responsibility is to be sure that our sensor is giving off a fragrance, though, that our lifestyle, our words, smell like Christians. Do you smell like a Christian to other people? No, seriously, do you? Because sometimes I use the phrase, passing the smell test. You've heard that before. And people who don't know Jesus are sniffing you. And the question is, they're sniffing and looking at your lifestyle and your words, and they're thinking, does this person really pass the smell test or not? And you have to be able to pass the smell test to have that credibility so that your words are matching up with your lifestyle. So that that sensor that's giving off this aroma, the message of the gospel, when you speak those words, the person puts it together and says, yeah, I can see that's true in your life. And so that's the principle, that's why I'm calling it the principle of odor. Here's the third principle in our passage. It's just one verse, verse 17. This is the principle of the offer. The principle of the offer, verse 17. And the principle goes like this. We must be careful not to sell the word of God for financial gain. Now Paul uses the word peddle here. It means like a retail dealer, someone who has goods to sell, maybe in the marketplace. And they're trying to make a profit. And the word was actually used of a street vendor. Actually, more than that, the word that he uses really could be translated huckster. Okay? And in Paul's day, there were many itinerant philosophers and teachers who were going all throughout the Middle East, the Roman world at that time. They traveled about. They had some kind of a teaching to give. That's why... That's why when Paul showed up in Athens and went up to that place called the Areopagus, all the philosophers sat around up on this hill and they would tell stories or talk about their particular philosophies. And then here's this guy that comes up and he says, I'd like to get in on this discussion with you. And they look at him and they call him a seed picker. What does this seed picker have for us? But they let him speak. He had something new. And so he taught the philosophy of Jesus. Well, these philosophers would go all throughout to big cities and to villages. But they had to live, and so they would always demand payment before they would begin speaking. And Paul says that he was not like one of them. He wasn't one of these traveling, itinerant teacher philosophers that demanded payment before he would espouse his new philosophy. Now, occasionally, I hear churches or ministries or even evangelistic efforts spoken of in marketing terms. In fact, in the 80s and 90s, I picked up some books books that I still have, marketing the church, you know, this kind of thing. And they're actually written by Christians, and they were Christians who were trying to probably do the right thing. They were taking their expertise in marketing and salesmanship and those kind of things, and they were trying to apply it to the church. But as I look back on that, I don't think Christians 
are meant to be salesmen for God. We are ambassadors, going back to that idea. Not salesmen. We're not street vendors. They're just peddling the Word of God. And we should not be trying to figure out how we can monetize the message of the gospel for financial gain. Some of you might remember this old movie. It came out in 1960. That's Burt Lancaster. The name of the movie was Elmer Gantry. Look it up. Maybe find it. Because that was a very interesting movie. It was about a guy who learned to be a preacher in the tent circuit, the sawdust trail of that time. And that he would go from town to town and the tent would be set up and all the musicians and everything and they would put out the billboards and come see the evangelist Elmer Gantry and people from all over town would come in and he would preach and by the way he won an Academy Award for best actor that year portraying Elmer Gantry but as you go through the movie what you find is that his life and his lifestyle behind the scenes, didn't exactly match up. I won't tell you the rest of the story, but it was a very popular movie. And maybe you can remember bits of it. And you can remember how they would send around the offering plate and they would go back behind stage afterwards and money would just be going everywhere because it was all about the money. Make a lot of money. Look, God doesn't want us to monetize the gospel in any way. And that's why Paul says he's not peddling the gospel. Let me give you an application or two for this. I think we need to be very careful to scrutinize all of our ministry programs, our public worship, our methods of evangelism, everything we do as a church, I think we need to scrutinize it to make sure that we can never be perceived as peddling the Word of God. And while we might not be able to do this for every seminar or conference that we put on going forward from here, that's why, that's why it was free to come to the parenting conference. We'll give you the book. We'll give you everything free. That the idea is we don't want money to be perceived as what we're after here. That we're putting on conferences because we can make a profit. And there are many churches who actually do that. They put on big conferences and they rake it in because they charge an entrance fee. You know, there are many, many preachers and churches out there, and a lot of them are on TV, who have that reputation especially among the unsaved, for being money-hungry swindlers. And I know you've seen them. Because after their TV message, then it zeroes in on that guy. And yes, they need money to be able to pay the bills to go on TV. It's very expensive. But it seems like it just goes on and on. And what you can get free if you'll send in this particular donation. That's why Elmer Gantry and his character, that movie, struck such a chord with people at that time. Well, that's the principle of the offer. Here's the last one. It's the principle of the obvious. The principle of the obvious. This is chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. And the principle is this. The results of our evangelism will be obvious to all. Now, in the first century... It was very common for itinerant teachers to carry with them letters of recommendation. And you need to think of these letters of recommendation like, like reference letters that you may have been asked for when you applied to a job or maybe you attached to your resume. Your reference letters from other people as to your character or maybe from other employers. 
And that's what these itinerant teachers would carry, and they would present these reference letters as a recommendation. Oh, this guy's really good. You need to, you need to listen to this guy and pay him for what you're going to hear. And Paul's critics in Corinth here apparently expected Paul to have those same kind of recommendation letters. And he didn't. And instead, Paul says, you want a recommendation letter? I'll tell you my recommendation letter, what it is. It's the Corinthian Christians. They are the letters. They are the ones that you can read. Just look at their lives. All of these people who, ex who have obeyed the gospel and accepted Christ. And he adds that their lives were actually the result of his ministry. They themselves, he's arguing, a sufficient testimony. And their changed lives could be seen by all people as living letters written by the Holy Spirit on people's hearts. As one author that I read this week said, the author was Christ, the pen was Paul, and the ink was the Holy Spirit. And so what Paul is saying is, look, the results are obvious to all. His evangelistic efforts could be seen by anyone. Now the application is that, look, we all don't have the spiritual gift of evangelism or evangelists. There is a spiritual gift of those that have been given that gift that have a particular capability, a spiritual capability to do that work. And we don't all have that gift, but we are all called to be evangelists, to do that work. And we are to carry the gospel to our spheres of influence, whatever those spheres of influence are. And I'm so proud that in our church that we've got a group of men and women who are part of the Christian Motorcycle Association, CMA. Because you guys are carrying the gospel in influence by just showing up at the events, the rallies, the places you go. And as Jeff and I were talking about this morning, if I showed up dressed like this, at one of those events with some of those guys, I wouldn't come out alive from it. Because I don't have one of those leather vests. And they have a special door of opportunity, and they have a, a, a special way that they can get into those events and are accepted and now they have those opportunities sometimes come before them. Look, we are all carrying the gospel. And we have to find whatever that sphere of influence is that we have that we can talk to people. Because the changed lives of people who have come to faith as a direct result of our evangelistic efforts should be obvious to all people. And this is where I'm going to end this morning. Do you have any letters that you can point to? Because Paul said, oh, I've got letters. i got something better than those that are written on parchment. I've got letters that are people. Just go talk to those people. And those people were Paul's letters People that had come to Christ. And the question is, do you have any letters? Are there any people anywhere in your life that came to Christ because you shared Christ with them? Anybody? You see, that's the principle of the obvious. And the obvious is that those Christians are the testimony. Let's pray. Lord, what an exciting passage when we are able to draw principles like this. And, and we thank you that we can take 
words that are historical and understand that even hidden within those are very clear principles that if we look closely are absolutely there. We're not reading it into it. They're there. And I thank you, Father, for the principles that we have been able to see this morning from this passage. I pray most of all, though, Father, that, that we wouldn't just walk away with these principles, but that we would think about these things. And in our conversations with people, even this next week, that, that this metaphor of a door would keep running through our mind visually. And we would be asking ourselves subconsciously, is there a door here? Is God opening a door? Is this a door he wants me to go through? Is this an opportunity? And is my life smelling like the Christian that I claim to be? Are those things happening here? And can I share the gospel? Father, I thank you for this time in your word this morning. We pray that the Holy Spirit will work in our hearts in Jesus' name. I don't know how many of you heard what I heard in today's message, but are we carrying a letter from Christ in our hearts? Can you please stand with us for further worship again?
Thank you for joining us in worship today. Dress and coffee and donuts.